I'm going to talk quite briefly about loads reconstruction. I don't want to tear into uh, the uh, lunch too badly. And what I'm going to show you is a way that we've uh, uh, provided to you in Design Life 9 to take measured strains and use those to reconstruct what loads must have been put on a structure. And, and most of this is actually capability that was in Design Life to begin with. And the first thing it starts out with is virtual strain gauge. Inside Design Life, for many releases, we had this concept of virtual strain gauge where I could literally go in and apply gauges to my, uh, uh, to my FE model by being an FE input coming up using a virtual strain gauge and actually apply virtual strain gauges to my FE model that would output from whatever loads I brought in and stresses from FE on, on output of stress or strain on the uh, legs of the gauge. And so that's been there since uh, probably uh, first release, I believe. Um, and we use it a lot for correlation. You know, I can go off and lay a gauge and see what kind of output I get on my FE model compared that to my uh, actual uh, test. Um, I can also use it for things like getting detailed results to go off and feed into things like crack growth. But we're going to use it here to basically mimic gauges that you've actually had on your real part and start to pick up responses of those gauges to unit loads. So the idea of the virtual strain gauge was there a lot for correlation, uh, maybe for detailed information. We're going to use it to actually come up with a transfer function to describe how loads affect those gauges. The other piece that was there was uh, this concept of glyph builder, where we have a Python scripting glyph and we have a MATLAB scripting glyph that allows us to bring data in, do something to it, and send out new data. And that, again, that was existing capability. And we're going to use the, the Python scripting glyph along with virtual strain gauge to piece together a process that's actually part of Design Life's uh, nines worth examples to take measured strains and output uh, apparent loads. Okay. And so the first starting point of this is going to be a, uh, a model inside of Design Life that has basically applied unit loads or possibly um, you, uh, taking the approach of modes of position has a variety of mode shapes calculated. We bring those in and using virtual strain gauge will output for every one of those load cases a response to the strains. So you know, each gauge will give me a response to load one. Each gauge will give me a response to load two, response to load three. In essence, that is uh, basically a function that would tell me, it's a matrix, really, that goes off and tells me how the, uh, each gauge responds to those loads. If I were to think about this, I could take that matrix, invert it, and now I have a matrix that says, if I have this uh, basically strain response, it does this to the loads. And this one does this to the loads. So I can literally go in and create a transfer function that tells me if I bring in strains, what were the loads that would have created those strains. Okay. Just, just a tad back, a, a bit of background is if I have any sort of structure and I lay gauges on it, I can get, obviously get the gauge responses from those strain gauges. But there's ways that I can go in and put together those strain responses to describe what the forces are. Now, obviously, this, something like this where I have two gauges, I uh, apply uh, an axial force, I can back and recompute what the forces must have been to get those strain gauge responses. Again, I could uh, go off and in this particular gauge configuration, do the same thing and basically uh, predict what the bedding moment must have applied to it. Now, in order to do this, I have to actually go off and do these calculations myself. However, coming in through the virtual strain gauge, I'm actually using the FE model and loads in the FE model to basically give me the response in terms of material properties and geometry. OK. What I'm going to show you here is real quickly, there's, I said there's a worth example for this. And let me go off and go there and see if I can talk you through how this 
works. This is actually the, uh, the process that's part of that worked example. And here I have a very simple model and a set of, uh, yeah, okay, got to make sure I hit the right thing here. Two things have happened here. One, I've brought in a model, and that model, let's go do John's trick. Um, has two things with it. If I go off and do this, this has already got strain gauges applied to this model. Those gauges were saved out with the model. Um, and at any time I open that model, these gauges would be imported with it. If I come close to one of these gauges here, you can see what I have here are three rosettes that were laid on this uh, uh, cantilever beam. These were actually laid at fairly, laid at fairly poor locations in terms of trying to turn this into a transducer, just to show the fact that we can go off and recover uh, that information. The other thing that's in this model is that there is the responses to, two, to four separate load cases. So I have here displacement stresses, and again, we don't, here we don't care about the displacements, stresses that represent the responses to, three, to four separate input loads. This could be unit static loads. This could be modes from an eigen solution. But what these represent are the various inputs that could go into this model. And each one of these will give me responses to my strain gauges. OK. The first pass through here, what we're going to do is we're going to take those individual load cases, and we're using a, a load provider. It's called time step. And so in time step, it's going to do nothing more than look at the uh, four load cases and play them one after, a uh, one after the other. Now, in this case, I'm not interested in a transient. But what I really want to do is I want to get a set of responses out for each one of these load cases. And so what's going to come out of the virtual, uh, the, the virtual strain gauge as results will be uh, a time series for each gauge with four points on it. Point one is going to be the response to load one. Point two is the response to load two, and so on. Okay. I'm just going to go off here and hit run here. Now, so this is the virtual strain gauge. It's just taking the model results and the strain gauge is defined. It's going to output a time history for each gauge leg. And again, the points in this time history represent loads. Um, those are being brought into the loads reconstruction. Before I do that, let me give you a, an idea of what popped out here. If I were to look at what actually came out, each time series is a column here. So uh, this is the response for gauge one. And each one of these rows is the response to one of those four loads. And so I have these, again, for uh, the three legs of gauge one, the three legs of gauge two, three legs of gauge three. If I show you it like this, it's a matrix. So basically, what I'm bringing in is a matrix. And this loads reconstruction glyph is nothing more than a Python scripting glyph. If I were to go inside it, it's just a Python program. The first 20 lines or so are bringing in this data in terms of time series and literally putting them into a matrix. And then it takes that matrix and inverts it. Now, you'll notice that matrix isn't square, so the inversion isn't a true inversion, but it's a pseudo inversion where I can go in and basically flip the rows and columns of that uh, matrix, if you will. So now what I have is a matrix that isn't loads giving me responses to strain gauges. It's a matrix that gives me, I have the strain gauge, it gives me those load responses. And we take that new pseudo-inverted matrix and we feed into it what would have been the measured strains for 
those particular gauges. So these would have been actually strains extracted from the model, extracted from the part, uh, the actual part tested, that were the responses of each of those gauge legs. These come into the scripting glyph, get multiplied by that new, that new transfer uh, matrix. And what the output is here is a reconstruction of what the load cases had to look like, the actual loads going into that structure that would have created those strains. So it gives me a mechanism to go off, reconstruct what the loads had to be to get those strain histories. What this is useful for in doing is at times we don't have the instrumentation to actually measure those loads directly. And I could go in and take gauges existing on my part and use the gauge responses along with the FE results to go back and reconstruct these loads. And again, this can work both in static, it can also work in modal. The same way that John was talking about modal superposition, we could use this approach to actually back compute what the modal coordinates would have had to be, had to, be to uh, basically generate strains from a uh, dynamic analysis. Now, it's not magic. Um, there's, there's limitations to what it can do. Obviously, in order for this to work, we have to have more gauges, gauge legs, than we have loads going in. I can't, you know, basically have three gauge traces and compute load histories for 20 loads. Um, also, the gauges have to be somewhat logically uh, applied such that they kind of separate out the responses of the loads. But the long and short of it, this is actually a capability that was almost all in design life to begin with. With the addition of this one scripting glyph, we now have the ability to go in and to take information out of the FE, come up with responses for the virtual strain gauges, bring in actual strain gauge traces, and recompute the loads. OK? Questions? Okay. Make a comment on that. One, one thing I think is really interesting about this, if you can kind of take it to its next step, if you like, is that, um, I mean, and there's actually a really exam nice example that Jeff has, he didn't have time to show it right here, where that wind turbine blade, where he was able to take individual measurements, so field measurements, actual strain gauge measurements on just a few locations on my strain gauge that you can measure, calculate, in this case, modally, how much of each mode do you have? Maybe you've got that example. Yeah. And then take those loads in, do the fatigue calculation, full field on the whole model, and then do a fatigue calculation. So if you can imagine, if you like, the, the ins and the outs of the process, by having a finite element model of, uh, in this case, with the, with the modal responses, the, the, just the mode shapes, actually ab able to calculate just from a few strain gauge measurements the stress distribution over the whole wind turbine blade and therefore the fatigue calculation on the whole wind turbine blade, even though you only measured strain on a, effectively a fairly small subset of locations. So that really enables you to go from a limited set of test data with relatively simple FE calculation to then do a full field stress and fatigue calculation on the whole structure. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Well, as I was say, this is the, the blade that John was talking about. It's a 50 meter uh, blade. There's about 24 rosettes on here. And this is actually a test that was being done up in Colorado. And this blade actually extends pretty much the whole room. And they have uh, transducers on the blade trying to excite natural frequencies to, to, to test the blade. And so what I did is I took the uh, uh, base of the blade and I brought in frequencies for the first natural for the first three natural modes of the frequencies. I modulated these. So basically, the actual frequencies are the spacing of those points there. I modulated these because my goal originally was to see which gauges were responding to which modes. And so just by looking at the modulation, I could output and see what the gauges were doing. Uh, but I put those in, and the original purpose was to go off and to post-process the gauge information to show how we could uh, deal with that. I then took that information, and so what this is here is the modes, first 10 modes of that blade with the gauges on, going through the same process you just saw, 
these were the outputs of the actual gauges, these become the modal coordinates. And what John was saying is once I have modal coordinates and I have modal stresses, I can literally go in, put that back into design life, and calculate full field fatigue. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh